friends. Welcome to my online panel, Fantastic Detailing for Props and Armor. Uh, I am one half of Calbutt Crunchy's cosplay, and today I'm going to do a one-hour presentation on one of my favorite topics that I like to present at cons, but in an online format. Uh, so this panel is going to go over uh, what I personally like to put into my cosplays in terms of detailing with thermoplastics, foam, um, all of that good stuff. So please stay tuned if you want to learn uh, a little bit about how to go about putting that into your cosplays. Um, so to start a little bit about me, uh, like I mentioned, I am one half of the duo Calbutt Crunchies cosplay. Um, I'm kind of the one with a stickler for a lot of the over the top sort of things. Um, whereas Scone likes the smaller kinds of detailing, which is also completely fine. Uh, but I like to do a lot of different types of things. So I, I make all kinds of stuff from armor to big ball gowns to wigs. And we also do a lot of tutorials. We've taught at cons around the world. I've also really recently published a book on extreme wig styling. Um, but one of my favorite things to do if I pull up this presentation here for you guys, um, one of my favorite things to incorporate into whatever cosplay that I am wearing is detailing. Uh, I find it really fascinating. I, I think it's really cool, especially if you're doing an original interpretation or maybe you're following a design um, that you have to be a little creative uh, when interpreting that into something three-dimensional. Um, I think it's really neat how the materials that we have access to today can let us sculpt and create all kinds of different types of detailing. So these are three cosplays that I have made uh, in the past. Um, all, actually, all of them do use thermoplastic, although in the center, Helga, um, this is a great example of lots of different types of detailing you can do depending on the material. Um, so we've got foam in here, we've got plastic, we've got resin, um, and each material was chosen based on its properties and the types of detail that you can get out of it. Um, so I don't think that there's any one type of material to use for everything and part of what we're going to be going over during this panel is what are the different materials we have out there available to us and what can you accomplish with each of them. Uh, so first we're going to go over uh, a little bit of an overview about each of those materials. Um, because they all are very, very different. And then in the second half of this, I'm going to get down into uh, a, a little bit more of the nitty gritty about what you can actually accomplish with each of those types of materials and also some cool tips and tricks that you guys might want to use to incorporate into your own cosplays. So let us get started here. Uh, first of all, I think one thing that people really do think of um, in terms of cosplay materials is, of course, thermoplastics. These have become wildly popular in the last 10 years. I'm sure all of you guys have had the opportunity to, to use maybe at least one of these. Um, if you've used all of these, that is also fantastic. You by no means need to use every single one of them in your cosplays. But what we're going to talk about is why are these different and why do we care about, about which one we're using? Uh, because, you know, they are all technically plastic. Yes, that is true. But the thing is, is that there's no one best plastic for everything. There's a reason we have four different kinds of warbler here. If it was the exact same material, why would they put out different lines? Um, each one behaves in a slightly different way, and so each one is going to allow us to accomplish slightly different types of detailing on our cosplays. And they're also going to handle a little bit different. Um, so you'll want to choose your material based on what you are trying to accomplish. Uh, the first one I want to talk about, actually, is not really what I would call a detailing material, but I do want to go over it briefly just because it's something that I think a lot of people haven't had the opportunity to use. Uh, this is one of Warbla's lines called Mesh Warbla. Um, if anyone has ever used an older thermoplastic called Wonderflex, this is kind of Warbla's answer to that. Uh, Wonderflex is a plastic that it has a mesh grid inside of it, and so it makes it really Really, really strong. You cannot tear this stuff. But as a result, Wonderflex does not bend in a 3D complex curve that Warbla is uh, 3D complex uh, that Warbla is really known for. Um, you could only get like one-dimensional types of curves out of it. But with Mesh Warbla, 
even though it does have uh, that fibrous material embedded inside of it, you can actually get some pretty complex curves and you can get um, even more of a bend and a stretch and a pull than you could do with other warbler materials. Whereas those might tear the more you stretch them apart, because of that um, fiber inside of it, mesh warbler won't tear. So you can get really extreme shapes out of it. But as a result, because of that mesh in there, you can't get really fine details. The mesh is just too thick for you to get something like a, like a small noodle or a little fiddly sculpted bit. Um, so I really do not recommend it for actual detailing. Um, what this is really fantastic for is if you need to say attach something like a D-ring or a buckle or some, or fabric even to your piece or your warbler, this stuff is amazing because it will never tear no matter how much stress you put on it. And it's also really, really sticky. It's actually stickier than any of the other Warbler lines. Um, so I've used this stuff to stick handles on things. Um, it's a good support. If, if you have one thin piece and you're afraid of its tearing, just slap some more of this on the back and it will be good forever. But I would skip over this if you're really looking for actual detailing in your piece. Instead, the kind of classic warbler that we all know and love is called Warbler's Finest. A lot of people call this brown warbler, including myself. Uh, what this is, is this is PLC plastic plus wood filler. Um, that's why when you heat it up, it smells a little bit like sugar cookies. Some people have said that. I think it smells a little bit like sawdust, um, but uh, the filler is what helps it keep its shape as you heat it. Um, and, and that's how you can get those nice smooth curves for say a bracer or when you're laying it on top of something. Um, there's no mesh backing, so you can stretch it, but you can tear it. But because there's no mesh in here, you can get some really great detailing. If you break it down, if you heat it a lot, the more you heat it up, the more bendy and flexible it can become. Um, if you heat it past its um past the standard point that you normally need to for for warbler you can actually begin to press pieces together and sculpt with it as though it's clay um, that's a really cool effect the only downside is you can see the filler uh, if anyone has ever worked with this you know how you always have to prime this stuff because you have that grain on top of it it's the same case when you're detailing. Um, that's the uh, that's the wood filler grain coming through, and so you always need to prime this quite a bit, and the grain, uh, you lose out on a bit of the detailing when you're working in a really small scale. Um, but this is a really great basic material to use for anything, especially for the base pieces. So like if you're making a breastplate, this is, this is the way to go because this stuff is a great combination of strong and it's very sticky. It sticks together um, really easily if you just heat it up. Um, when people started using brown warbler, they said, wow, I really love this stuff, but man, I hate priming it. I hate that, that sandy texture on top. Can we have a warbler that's actually smoother, please? And warbler went, yes, you can. You can have black warbler. Instead of the wood filler, black warbler's um, filler is actually charcoal. So that's where we get our black color from. And that's also why this is a lot smoother than classic flavor warbler. Uh, as a result, though, it's not quite as sticky. It's still sticky, don't get me wrong. You can put two pieces together, but you need to take more care when you do that. You need to make sure both pieces are heated up. There's actually a slightly glossier side to this, um, which has a little bit more glue in there. But as long as you heat both pieces and really firmly push them together, you're still gonna get a strong bond. Um, but with brown, it's a lot easier to heat and stick them together. It doesn't have to be as hot. I've even stuck things on when I've not heated one side. But with black, be a little more careful. Sticking black to brown, totally great. You can stick any of these kinds of warbler together um, with the sole exception of the clear transpart kind. Uh, but the black warbler is really great to use for your detailing and for the top layer of something if you need multiple layers of warbler because it's much smoother. Um, it's easier to knead together uh, when you're creating details and also it stays heated for, for a pretty good amount of time. I like using black warbler quite a lot. 
Uh, this is uh, th this is an example of two things that I've made um, solely from black warbler. Um, so over on the left, uh, all of those little um, sculpted details, all of the uh, edging, that is all done with uh, warbler black. And then the feathers, I had a lot of fun doing that. I actually have a whole tutorial on how to do, how, how to do this, but these are just two pieces of black slapped over some foam. And then when it's heated, you can just cut little shapes into it. It takes, um, it takes those kinds of shapes and cuts really, really, really nice. Um, I like working with this a lot, but I've actually not worked with it as much recently because along came Pearly Warbler. Um, this is extremely similar to black. Uh, people have asked me like, oh, should I get both of them? Uh, not, not really. They kind of fulfill the same niche in my opinion. Per, uh, pearly is like very slightly smoother. You can tell it's a little smoother and it, and you don't need as, as much priming, but like it, it is a minute amount. It is not the same jump in, in level that we got from brown to black, but it is a touch smoother. Um, it's also white, which uh, people who don't want to prime uh, would like, but the heating properties are actually really different for this. Uh, when you heat it, when you normally heat up Warbla, you heat it with your heat gun, you kind of see it become a little glossy, and then you know that it's time to uh, use it. it. It's sticky enough that you can begin to bend and mold it. With Pearly, you don't get that glossy sheen. In addition, it's pretty quick to heat, but it loses heat extremely fast. Um, with Black, you know, you can build most of, most of your edging in one go. With Pearly, you absolutely cannot do that. You cannot sandwich two pieces together in one heat cycle. You need to heat it up, put it together, heat it again, continue to, to put your piece together, um, and just continue, continue to do that until you're all finished. I'd say I get maybe like 45 seconds of workability out of one round of heating with Pearly Warbler. Um, but again, because it's smoother, it's even more fantastic for detailing. Uh, and these are two examples that I've made uh, using Pearly Warbler. The one on the left, the silver bird knees, um, those actually are not primed. Uh, and the texture is still pretty good. You can see, you can get a little, you can see a little bit of the grain, uh, but I, I didn't want it super, super smooth. And that's just what it looks like raw, and I kind of liked it. Um, however, over on the right with the Button Knight armor, uh, that is actually primed, uh, but we only needed maybe two coats of our of our Flex Bond primer, which is generally what I, I use for this stuff. But you can get it really nice and smooth, and I enjoy working with that a lot as well. Again, they are kind of the same thing as as black in terms of which one do you want to use for detailing you can pick and choose between those two i think so the last plastic that we're going to talk about is thibra which i think is actually pronounced thibra no one has been able to tell me if one way or the other which one is true so i'm going to call it thibra uh but this is pretty different from the Warbler lines that we were just talking about. This is a different manufacturer, completely different product. And I also want to be clear, when this first came out, a lot of people were looking at this and saying, oh, it's a Warbler substitute. How can we substitute this for Warbler? And my answer to that is don't. This is not Warbler. Uh, this is not a Warbler substitute. It does not have the same properties as Warbler. It is not useful for the same things, in my opinion. Some people do use it as the base for their armor and more power to them. I cannot do that. I struggle with that quite a lot. And so I use this for something completely different. Um, Thibra is, inter is very different because it does not have the filler that Warbler does. Part of the reason why you can heat up the Warbler and it bends in a nice smooth curve is the filler is strong and keeping it together in its shape. Thibra has very little, if any, filler at all. And so when you heat this, you are essentially heating up pure plastic. And when you heat up pure plastic, the plastic is going to become malleable and without any filler inside to hold its shape, it is just going to droop and turn into what I like to call essentially bubble gum. When you heat up Thibra, you can stretch it, you can push it over any shape to your heart's content. Um, it is incredibly malleable and incredibly smooth without that filler. 
But as a result, if I'm trying to make something that's not detailed, like say a bracer, imagine trying to make a bracer out of bubble gum. Like it's gonna have ripples and, and problems in it, even with a foam base. So what I really prefer to use this for is a couple of things. One is it is utterly amazing for mold work. If you have a plastic mold, stick it in a mold. It is just like using, um, you know, sticking foam in there, sticking any kind of uh, little plastic pellets in there. Um, it will pop out perfect and smooth. It's really, really good for that. Um, it's also really good for if you need to press in any kind of details because, again, we're working with bubble gum. If I push in some kind of little hard object, I'm going to leave that impression in it. Uh, it will even pick up your fingerprints if you are not careful. That is how much you can affect this material. So it's amazing for any kind of stamping or embossing. It's amazing for if you want to run a, run a knife through it and make some kind of details that way. It's also amazing for if you have a complex shape, like you've already made your helmet shape and you want to just heat up and lay this plastic on top of it like it's a big old piece of fondant. Um, that is what this is good for, being a great top coat to things. Don't try and make a structural shape out of this. Don't try to mold it while it's hot. It is, that is going to cause you a world of hurt. The other thing to bear in mind with this is uh, if anyone has ever worked with Warbler before and you notice that bubbles can sometimes start to come up in your plastic when you're heating it, a lot of times that's because as you're, as you're heating your piece, you're heating up the foam layer um, that a lot of people tend to use for a structural layer underneath. And as you heat that up, air bubbles begin to off gas from the foam. And those air bubbles go up and they might become trapped underneath the warbler and they might bubble up visibly. With warbler, you can kind of put a pin in there, push it down. Um, this, this is not a humongous concern uh, a lot of the time because of the filler. It'll hold its shape, keep those air bubbles trapped underneath. Fibra, we have no, sh we have no filler here. So all of those little tiny air bubbles are gonna bubble up and mess up the surface of your Fibra. I really do not recommend heating Fibra more than two or three times or else you're going to have a big problem with these air bubbles. Um, there's no filler to stop it. It's going to be visibly not nice looking. So make an extra effort to not overheat and reheat your Fibra if at all possible. The last thing to bear in mind with this is this is the stickiest thing you will encounter. This is incredibly sticky so of course it'll stick to itself it'll stick to warbler it'll stick to anything plastic and it will stick to your plastic countertop um, always use a silicon mat when you're working with this material to be honest a silicon mat is a great investment to make for any kind of thermoplastic uh, it'll help keep your surface protected and if you overheat your material and it becomes sticky enough to become stuck to the floor or your countertop the silicon mat will prevent that. They're really inexpensive. Just look for baking mats at any craft store or online. They're 10 bucks or less, and I've used mine for years. They are a really great tool to have. And this is an example of some items that I have made from Thibra. Um, one thing that these two pieces have in common is there is a lot of texture going on here. And that's really what I like to use this for. If something is going to have a lot of texture, like for instance, the lines on Loki's horns, um, those are something that are carved in with a, with a sculpting tool. Or on the left, uh, Naxxus's entire outfit has a lot of texture pressed into it with a bit of aluminum foil. And we'll get to a close-up of both of those in a second, but that is something that would be difficult to do with a plastic that has a lot of filler, because it won't pick up that level of detail. And also, if I get a, a couple bubbles, it's okay because I am putting texture on top of them and I can kind of push them down and mask them as well. Um, so this is when I like to use Thibra, if it's something highly, highly detailed and texturized. Otherwise, I will kind of use Warbler for especially the base of any of my pieces or something larger. This is another example of uh, something that Fibra is really great for, and it's actually also an example of something Warbler is good for. Um, I really like to combine multiple materials. That it, that's 
one of my favorite things to do with cosplay, honestly, uh, because first of all, if you choose the right material for the job, you're going to make your life a lot easier. Um, it's hard to force a material to do something that it's not intended for. Um, so you're going to have an easier time. Second of all, uh, I think it looks really visually uh, interesting if you've got a lot of different types of details going on in your piece. Uh, so here with this helmet, we have... I don't know why I'm pointing at this for you guys. This is not this is not correct at all. Um, we do have foam for the horns, which is something we'll be getting into in a little bit. And then the top part of the helmet, if you guys can see all of the surfaces um, on the on the gold areas, except for the, the parts right here, that is Thibra. And that's because I wanted to emboss and stamp and add little tiny details on top of it. Um, and so even though I did get a lot of bubbles, I was able to push them all down with all of that stamping. Um, the large filigrees, those are also Thibra pressed into a mold, um, which is perfect for that type of material. But then the two large gold pieces hanging over the horns, those are not Thibra. That is something that really needed a lot of structure, first and foremost. I didn't emboss that. I wanted the edging to be nice and smooth and not bubbly, and so I just used black warbler for that. So it's a combination of all these different types of materials um, that let me accomplish what I wanted in the easiest way possible. So what we have with this video is just a quick live demo of me using Thibra. Um, again, bubble gum. Uh, what we have is the flat surface of the foam. I've heated it up really well, laid it on like a piece of fondant, and then we just continue to heat and press in all of the edges. Um, I really love silicone tools. We'll talk a little bit about what tools uh, to purchase later on, um, but this is right here, me embossing that texture into the warm Thibra. Um, if your tool is plastic, definitely put some, something like Vaseline on it so that it does not stick to the plastic material. But when it's heated, you can just press that little piece right into the plastic and we have gotten some incredible texture out of it. This was really fun to do. I love this costume a lot. Here's another example of how I've used Thibra in my cosplays. Uh, this is Loki's horn. And again, we are starting with our solid structural piece. In this case, this is a piece of pink foam. Uh, heating up the Thibra, wrapping it around the horn. I'm doing this in multiple pieces, and that's okay, especially with Thibra. Because it's so flexible and moldable like bubblegum, when I heat it up, I can actually smooth away that edge and make it look like one solid piece. And you guys can see I am doing that right here. Um, I was actually a smart person and put some silicone, a uh, little silicone tip on my finger so I didn't burn myself. But then while it's still warm, we can press in those grooves with a tool and then make a lot of really, really amazing texture that way. All right, so for the next section, we're going to get into a couple non-plastic options. Um, plastics are great. Plastics are really, really good for if you want something quite solid, honestly, uh, something that's not going to break or tear. Uh, but, you know, plastic is kind of expensive and plastic is kind of heavy. So it's not always the best material to use, especially because there's been some really, really cool materials out on the marketplace lately. Uh, but the classic, of course, is Ava foam. Um, this is pretty accessible. A lot of companies carry different types of foam. Uh, most, most of what people look for is either high density or um, the type that says 38. Um, that's a pretty good weight. But what I like to use this for is anything that you want to be lightweight. So horns is a really great example for that. These are actually uh, hollow to make them even lighter. Um, that entire breastplate is also foam, including all of the little scales in the front. The great thing about foam is it's, again, inexpensive and lightweight, um, and also it's pretty moldable as well. You, you can't get quite the same complex curves. Um, you can't get quite the same um, stretchiness that you can with thermoplastic, but you know you can always 
use a pattern um, so, uh, to create that complex curve out of multiple pieces and then fill in that seam or that gap so that it's hidden from sight. Some other really nice things you can do with foam is tooling. Uh, what this is, is if we take something like a wood burning tool or a hot knife, that heat is going to burn away the foam whenever we cut through it. So um, if we look back at the horns, th those grooves and, and that texture is the result of just running a hot knife through, and we can kind of see it in, in the example on the right, and burning away that foam and then creating a really, really cool texture um, texture that way. I love doing that. That is like one of my favorite things to do with foam, to be honest, is just to create these kinds of grooves. Uh, if you want something even more detailed than that, there is a product called Foam Clay, which I hope everyone has had the opportunity to use because it is amazing and I love it. Um, if I really like to sculpt three-dimensional things, to be honest, I, I have a really fun time doing it. And that was a lot of why I didn't use foam for a while. You can't really do that with a big sheet of Ava foam, but you can do that with foam clay. Uh, what foam clay is, is it comes in a little jar. Um, the first one I used was from a shop called Lumens, uh, who Arda carries, but there's a lot of different brands now. And essentially when you pull it out, it, it feels like a really, really mushy, malleable clay. And you can create all kinds of stuff with it. Anything you can create with that soft clay, you can make. So in this case, uh, these are my little branches on Helga and I sculpted each of them out. But then if you allow it to dry for one to two days, it becomes hard. And it isn't hard like clay, it's actually hard like foam is hard. It's got a little bit of flex. Uh, it's not super flexible because you can, if you flex it too much, I have broken uh, pieces like that. Um, but it does have a little bit of a give to it. And of course, it's really, really lightweight. Um, it is great to use if you love detailing things like that. Um, it also has some very distinct properties that I want to talk about real fast because I think some people struggle to use it. Um, when you take it out of the jar, it is really, really stretchy and very, very bubblegum-like, um, which, first of all, fantastic for detailing. You can make all kinds of stuff. Not fantastic for structural support. So if your goal is to create something that stands up on its own, that is not going to happen. Um, but if your goal is to push it into a mold, this is the time to do it. If you leave it out for, you know, maybe a couple minutes, five minutes, it will dr already dry out a tiny, tiny bit. And as we can see here, this is a little bit drier. As a result, you can't buff away the seams as well. You can't push it into a mold as well, um, but it will structurally hold its shape. If your clay dries out a tiny bit too much, just add water like I just did there and you can rehydrate it again. Um, if you let it dry out over the course of maybe an hour or two, it's going to be too far gone. So just be careful about that. I actually like to keep my clay in a big plastic bag. I don't trust the container, um, but I keep it in there just to make sure that it's really not dried out at all. But when you're using the clay, you know, think to yourself, well, what am I making? What state do I want it in? If I want to put it in a mold, I want to take it out of the bag and use it immediately. That's the perfect time to do it. But if I'm making like a little sculptural guy and I need say like a wing to hold up and hold its shape and fight against gravity, I should wait a couple minutes and let my clay uh, get into this semi dry, um, you know, more structural state before I start sculpting with it. Uh, so one other type of thing I want to talk about is, well, what about things that are not foam and not thermoplastic? Is that my only option? And the answer is no, of course it is not. You can use all kinds of stuff for detailing. Uh, some things that I have really enjoyed using in the past year is uh, craft foam. Um, and uh, this is actually, this isn't quite craft foam. This is like a weird foam vinyl that I found in a store. It's, just a, it's like a little one millimeter piece of foam with some vinyl on top so it doesn't get torn up, but like, oh my God, it is my new favorite thing. I love this thing. Uh, I cut this out with a Cricut, 
uh, which is essentially uh, a little machine that I'll, I'll feed it a pattern that I've drawn and it will cut that shape out for me. So it cut all of these little white filigree pieces and I picked them up and I stuck them on my Thibra because Thibra is very, very sticky. So when I heated it up, I just slapped them right on and it made the most amazing texture. Um, so that is one of my little arm pieces down there that has that filigree stuck in there. Uh, that stuff is really, really fun. You can get some great details, even if it's a small piece of foam. Like, you know, most foam in the craft store is only two millimeters tall, but if you're working really small, it can be really, really beautiful. Um, the foam is also actually up on the top of that bracer where that snake design is. That's some slightly thicker foam that I cut out on the Cricut, but still really, really cool texture. Uh, and then also kind of scored into the foam is the the um, linked texture on the bottom of the bracer. That one is not a raised piece, but that's instead a scored piece that I've cut down into into it. And then in the middle of that bracer is actually not foam at all. That's a piece of vinyl fabric that I got in the craft store. Um, that's actually Yaya's uh, scale pattern. Uh, you're supposed to wear it on your body, but I put it on a bracer and I really like how it looked. You could paint just right on top of it and no one will ever know. Uh, you can also use literally anything that isn't flat. This is masking tape that I stuck on some foam because I thought it looked like a branch and I liked it. So, you know, use trash, use whatever you have around your house. It does not have to be a traditional material. You can make details with all kinds of stuff. And I, I think the more creative you get, sometimes that's the better that it looks. You know, don't, don't feel like you have to follow the rules. Um, you know, don't be afraid to experiment. Also, don't be afraid to redo something if it doesn't work out the first time. For the final part of this presentation, I want to talk about some more specifics um, and some more specific techniques that I personally like to do. One thing I do want to point out um, is that this is just the way that I detail. Uh, this is this is what I like to do. This is not the only right way to do it, obviously. There's no one right material, and then there's no one right way to detail. Uh, but hopefully this will give you guys some inspiration. Uh, to start with, uh, you do need some tools. That That is the one thing you can't really futz around with that much. You, you need some tools to help you out. And, you know, while all of these are not necessary, they are going to make your life a lot easier. Um, first of all, if you are working with foam or thermoplastics, you really need a heat gun, not a blow dryer, uh, an actual heat gun. The one that I use is from um, from the home improvement store. Uh, if you can find one with a cool down button that will help extend the life of your heat gun, do not buy the one from the craft store. Uh, sometimes they sell these little blue ones like this big. That is not what you want. That is going to fail you within a year and it's going to be a waste of your money. Buy an actual good heat gun that will last you a long time. Uh, so heat gun is very useful. If you want to help your fingers, you can buy heat resistant gloves. Uh, CosplaySupplies.com sells a pair for eight bucks. I'm sure other places do as well. There's also those little red silicone fingertips um, that I was using in one of the thermoplastic videos uh, to help smooth away the edges. Um, that will help if, if uh, you hurt your hands a lot or are very sensitive to the heat while you're heating up all of these products. Um, you also want tools for detail working and edging. Uh, so one of, of my favorite tools sets on one end is that a I got ball, from Amazon. And on one end is a silicon tip. And that tip is really nice for scoring along the edges. And it'll help push the plastic into those, uh, those 90 degree edges of your piece really, really well. I also have a set of inexpensive clay tools that I like to use to cut into and to um, score details like with my feathers. And then also, please get a silicon mat, especially if you're working with Thibra. Uh, it'll help protect your surface. It'll also help keep your thermoplastic from sticking to the table. And then some optional stuff is I like to use a wood burning tool again. Um, I love the Cricut. Uh, there's also a machine called the Silhouette, uh, but the Cricut will actually cut foam in the way that uh, we had a couple slides ago. So it is my new favorite thing. I use it so much. So detailing tips and tricks. So how can we make 
our detailing really pop. That is kind of the thing that always goes through my mind when I'm trying to decide how exactly I want to interpret a drawing into a cosplay. Um, I love I love this helmet in particular because I like looking at it all the time. There's so much going on, and even though there's a lot going on, your eye is really drawn to certain areas so that it's not too, too overwhelming and is really nice to look at. Uh, so I always like to try and put that level of detailing into my stuff. I work really small and also really big at the same time. But you know what? You should do what works for your aesthetic. Uh, but for me, there's a couple goals that I keep in mind. First is I love dimension. Uh, second is I love really dense stuff, but I also want it to be distributed properly throughout the cosplay. And then the third thing uh, that I think I, I didn't realize this for, for a little bit, and I think sometimes people forget about it, is details are great. But it doesn't matter if it's not clean. You, Whatever you are experimenting with and whatever you're putting in there and piling in there, you really still want to execute it really well or else all of that work is going to be for nothing. So for physical dimension, uh, what I mean by this is essentially you don't want something to look flat. Um, you know how a lot of uh, anime designs, you look you look at the outfit and it just looks like it's completely one-dimensional. Like maybe it has some bias around the side, but it looks like it's just incredibly flat on there. I don't like that. What I instead prefer is having different layers and levels of detail. And that is what really makes things pop, in my opinion, and gives you, and gives you a lot to look at. So for instance, um, with the branches here, we've actually got three different layers going on. Um, if, lean close if you, if you need to see, but we've got our base foam, which is the base structure, uh, Ava foam, that, that I have um, holding up the piece itself. Then we've got another layer of detail where I have cut in some grooves with a wood burning tool. And those are kind of the dark grooves that you can see running through it. So that's a layer that's down a little bit. And then we've got a third layer that's raised up. And that is the foam clay that I've raised on top uh, with the little branches running over the entire piece. So once it's painted, we have three different layers going on here, um, which I think really, really adds to the piece a lot. When I first made this, I actually only had the base foam and then I cut in uh, the grooves with the wood burning tool and I wore it to a con. But I looked at it afterwards and I said, wow, this is a really big piece. There's a lot more that could be going on here. And then afterwards, I actually repainted the whole thing, added the foam clay on top of it, and I'm a lot happier with it now. I think uh, it just adds a lot more interest to the piece. Um, another way that you can add that dimension is with edging. Um, not everything makes sense to add a whole bunch of stuff running all over the piece like this. If it's not the design, it's not the design. But a lot of people love to add edging to their armor and other designs um, because that is another layer of dimension that you can add in there. So the lines running along the edge of this armor, that, that's what I refer to as an edge. Um, that's an easy thing to do with thermoplastic. Uh, but also I had added some in the, in the center. Um, we've got these fun little uh, diamond patterns as an edge running down the sides. And then over on the right, we have an example of um, some ad additional detailing that I kind of actually added to this piece. This wasn't in the original artwork, but I decided I didn't really like how flat it looked. I thought it needed something. There was just too much of a flat space with no shading. I, I didn't like it at all. And so instead, I added these little vinyl stickers onto the glove and outlined them. And it gives a lot more interest uh, to the piece, in my opinion, and it gives you something to look at. So molded and raised details, uh, these are like the ones in my helmet. Uh, we've got the raised details, um, the, the big ones in the front. Again, that's Thibra pressed into a mold. Love that stuff. Um, and that gives a really, really interesting thing to look at in the front of the helmet. And then behind it, these are some smaller raised details that I cut from the Cricut. So you, you see how we've got raised details all over it, but in the front, 
the height is much, much different. There, there's a very distinct difference between the front and the back of the helmet. Um, and it's, it's the difference in that height and the difference in the type of details um, that, that's going to help your piece, in my opinion. Sculpted objects are really, really fun. Uh, it's actually been a little bit since I have done this. Uh, but one thing that I used to do out of thermoplastic, which now I, I honestly would recommend doing this out of foam clay instead. Uh, but back before foam clay was a thing that existed, I used to make three-dimensional sculpted objects out of warbler. And what you can do with that, if you are so inclined, is if you heat the warbler up quite a lot, you can get it into a state where it essentially behaves a little bit like clay. If it's that hot, you can fold it on top of itself, spuff out any seams, and essentially sculpt with it. You really, really, really have to use heat gloves for this. I'm not even joking. Do not do it without gloves on. Um, but you can sculpt like you would with clay and then stick it onto your warbler object and it's going to stay there. Uh, so on the left, um, these are some horses that I sculpted out for Celestia a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a couple different layers. Again, we've got that dimensionality going on. Um, so like the wings are raised up over the horse, which is raised up over the breastplate and it becomes really, really dimensional. And then on the right is uh, some Karasuno armor that I made also a couple of years ago. And these are my feathers. And again, what these are is these are just a piece of war or, or uh, two pieces of warbler. And what these are again is these are just two pieces of warbler. And I have used a clay tool to score lines in. Um, so we have dug that down and it adds some really, really interesting dimension and visual interest. Uh, also stacking the feathers on top of each other. You see how some are on top of others. Um, I think that that also goes a long way to helping give your piece um, something really interesting to look at. Don't ever put things just flat side by side if you can help it. Even if something call is, is supposed to be flat and side by side, try and like twist it a little bit. Like you see how the edges of the bracer feather, they're not perfectly straight. They kind of curve a tiny bit or the feather kind of twists up a little bit at the very tip. Little things like that will really help make your piece look more organic and more interesting in my opinion. Um, so just play around, uh, play around with things. Another example of sculpted objects is this breastplate. This is also some more Karasuno armor. Uh, again, these birds were sculpted out of Warbla and then attached to the large piece. Uh, you can get a lot of visual interest out of it. It also helps give you a really obvious place to paint. If painting is not your forte, um, when you have dimension, that's kind of like a guide for where to put your paints. So we've got the birds on the left. And the birds look fine, but the birds look a lot better on the right once we have added paint. And you can see all of the dark areas in the deep parts of the sculpt. That's your easy guide for where to put your darks and your lights. The higher the object, oh, of course, I'm going to put my lights up here. And any kind of groove, any kind of divot, that's where you can put the darks. We'll talk a little bit more about painting in a minute. But for adding texture, this is just golden when you've got fibra. Like, there is nothing more satisfying than just pressing a bit of aluminum foil in and getting this incredible stone texture like on the right, or just dragging a clay tool across a horn and getting this kind of really deep groove that you wouldn't be able to get from even from foam, even from warbler. Um, this is really, really fun and an amazing way to add really, really minute detail to your piece. Uh, so again, if this is your goal, you need to pick your material based on that. So always kind of come up with a game plan ahead of time um, and then choose your material based on what you are trying to accomplish. You know, if, if in my mind I was like, okay, well, I'm going to add this, this foil texture, I'm going to add this texture to the horn, Thibra is kind of the only thing I, I would go with, to be honest. Um, the other materials just won't give you that same kind of pop. Uh, so always make a game plan ahead of time. 
Uh, and again, we've got our super, super texturized Thibra here, which I love looking at this. That's why I put the video in twice. Uh, but this was a decision that I made ahead of time based on what I wanted to accomplish. And we've got a couple different things going on here. We've got the edging, um, the long pieces around the very edge of the main structure. Uh, that, that's our raised detail edge. We've got our embossing, um, adding a little bit of lower dimension uh, with the with the embossing that I'm doing right now in this video and then we've got another layer of raised detail that's not quite as tall as the edging but that little one millimeter foam vinyl not only is it a great filigree but we're at a different height than the edge so we've got all kinds of stuff going on here um, that really really pulls your eye in um, and I, I just love looking at this kind of stuff it's my favorite thing to do all right, and then finally, I do want to talk about painting uh, because the sad, sad truth is the most beautiful, beautiful material work that your hands can accomplish can be ruined by a bad paint job. Um, this is kind of, I think gold is, gold and silver are like, are kind of the really, you know, people, people can get that down pat. Um, I struggle a little more with color, uh, but metallics are really classic. Um, and you know the, the classic way to do it is you want your base color, you want your highlights for the pieces that are raised, and you want your darks or your shadows for the pieces that are recessed. So that could be something that is dimensional and cut down into the piece, or it could be a place uh, where there's a corner or a place where there's like a 90 degree angle and two things meet. Um, classically, it's supposed to mimic armor where people were not able to clean that area very well so you got a lot of grime and dirt there uh but that's one place where edging is your best friend or where dimension is your best friend when you have dimension on your piece where two pieces two places are meeting and there's a raised edge and the base of your piece that is a no-brainer for where to put your shadows so yes we've got some shadows along the edging but we've also got some shadows um, all where those sculpted pieces are, where the sculpted pieces meet the bodice. We're going to add some darks there. Where the little filigree pieces, uh, the, the vinyl pieces meet the bodice. We'll put a little bit of dark shadow there. And then we know to add our highlights on the highest raised up part. So I think um, I struggle a little bit with adding great weathering and texture to a flat piece because what are you going to do you're going to paint the edges dark and that's it that's kind of what i end up doing but if there's a little bit of detailing on there and a little bit of dimensionality i can add more weathering and i think it really makes the piece pop so this is uh my progress example of weathering um the first small picture on the left that is just the base coat um don't ever leave your piece like that please always 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 add a little bit of dark weathering um the middle piece i had added a little bit of bra of bronze in some areas and then the third and the uh top piece is where i really started going ham on the darks similarly here if i had not weathered my branch that would have not looked good at all um so the top branch is not weathered uh the bottom horn is not weathered adding the darks to those lowered wood burning areas and adding the lights uh, to the branches really, really helps your piece. Um, I cannot understate this fact, how important it is to weather um, and use your dimensionality as a guide. Uh, use your detailing to help you with that coloring process. And that's an overview for how I add detailing to my cosplay pieces, no matter what materials I'm using. Uh, if you guys are looking for more information, you can find us on Calbutt Crunchies on all of the sites on the internets. Uh, we're generally Calbutt Crunchies, except on Twitter, which has a character limit. And so we are Calbutt Crunchy. Uh, there's a lot of places you can find us. Uh, we're mostly active on Instagram. We also have a Patreon where all, uh, all proceeds are donated to cat charities because we're very big cat people, as you can tell from the cat back here. Uh, that's Finnick. Uh, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, 
Um, and I also have a store uh, with, with various things, books and designs and that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I hope you have some ideas to incorporate into your own cosplays in the future. If you do and you end up using any of this, uh, definitely tag us. We really love to see that kind of stuff. Or if you have any questions, just shoot us a message. Um, I hope you guys have found this useful uh, and has been very brain stimulating during this quarantine time. Uh, but please enjoy and let me know if you guys have any questions in the future. Thank you so much for watching.